being in the role that I am, I've had a number of letters come to me. But when one came to me and didn't come to my children, I was a little, uh, not upset, I was just a little surprised. And so I actually called a compliance officer directly. And I said, how come my children didn't receive a letter? And then I began to proceed. All that information, I won't say the company, all the information that you have is not just mine. You have my children's information, social security number, everything else that was part of that mix. A light bulb went off. So again, this is years ago. Now you're starting to see Equifax other companies. And I'm not, and I'm not here to uh, promote any one company, but you know you should have some type of credit monitoring. Today, you can't really trust anything, but what you should trust is that if an account activity occurs on you or a dependent or somebody else, you should be notified of that immediately. So even though you didn't prevent it, you should be aware of it, right? And you know, we should be demanding more. And I found this full force, and we did too, Kathleen. Um, anybody we did business with, I made them go through a grueling uh, security assessment. Well, guess what happened? Three years later, the industry caught up and it all came back to us. <laughs> so, but again, it improved. Right? You have your compliance baseline, and there's a level of residual risk because you know it's not secure. If you're compliant, it's still not secure. Right? Things change. But hopefully, over time, with this here, we're trying to raise the bar every time. So that level of compliance is going to become more mature. So some familiarization with terms. So cyber safety. There's a couple of different definitions floating out there. One you may have heard, well, if I, some of the stuff we're talking about now, if I uh, go out online, am I surfing the web safe? That's not what I'm meaning by this, although that is a connotation. Where the cyber physical world meets the digital world. So for instance, a medical device, your vehicle. Right? People think that their vehicles aren't connected. <laughs> transportation. Right? People think that transportation is connected now in some way, our airplanes. Now again, there's ways to segment that stuff out, right? That's, those are the things that we need to understand when we deliver this. But the concept of cyber safety is the first understanding, yes, these two domains that are coming together now, we have to really understand what the risks are and approach this very differently. And again, if, some, if anybody stood up and said you could reduce risk 100%, they'd be lying to you in anything. There's no way you can. But there's a window and you want to reduce that risk. And the risk that you are able to reduce, what's the residual risk? And you've got to have ways of addressing that residual risk. Same thing that you would do managing your financial aspects of your projects. How many are responsible here for project fis uh, fiscal management? How many here are responsible for you know, general project risk management of their projects? So is cyber part of that? It sure is. So that's a missing component that Kathleen and I and others were really trying back. So, so when, when, when was that? 2008? 2008 yeah. and um, nine. You know, really trying to address that. Mm -hmm. So and I, I do see the PM role and project manager uh, director role mm -hmm. elevating. And one area of that elevation, and you talked about the Global Cafe last night, incident managers. Since we have so many breaches, we need to manage them technically like projects. So why not have project managers that are somewhat cyber savvy become incident managers? And then what happens typically, uh, one second sir, what happens typically um, after uh, an incident? You have a down stream of projects that need to be implemented. Well, who's gonna run those? So I can tell you, you are, or have been my best asset. I can tell you right now. If it wasn't for all of you, I wouldn't be standing here for multiple reasons, both good and bad. No. <laughs> <laughs> Question, sir. Under the PI, and of course the you know, information security department, and, and to us it's all the same thing. I guess. Well, well, could you could you say the first part of that? I didn't quite. Didn't well, quite. The, the point is this: is that we were discussing it last night as well, and I don't see how you would separate cybersecurity and, and risk. Uh, if the company position, it's not a project management piece. I mean, if you've got it in place for the company, then your project manager's adhere to whatever the policies and procedures are around your 
with security policy, whether it's starting out with a, a non-disclosure of EAA and, and all the other stuff to get people on board, to having the people from the OIS team and the rest be part of the initial project team, so that if you are going out to a third party, you're, you're reviewing the SOG reports, whatever that third party vendor is, but it, it's already integrated into what would be the project management lifecycle methodology for a given company. I don't, I don't see them as separate entities that the PMs necessarily drive them. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, so just let me hear what I think you said. You said at this point you're already doing it? Well, yeah, I'm saying that the whole cybersecurity aspect is how a company governs itself and runs itself, which project management is a component. Correct, yeah. It's achieving fulfillment. Yeah. But, um, but I don't see it as a separate entity. I can see that it's important to make PMs aware of what all the cyber risks are and where they need to get on board. So perhaps there are some small businesses that don't already take that stuff into consideration. Yes, so some of the things that I see is, um, you know, part of it is a management discipline, but it's a mindset. So a lot of this is around mindset, and then it's not gonna, it shouldn't change a lot. There are some things, it's adding more questions to certain areas, probably some additional risk, maybe looking at work breakdown structure, to make sure you have certain activities as part of that, because a lot of times that I've seen in other project plans, they don't account for that up front. And so I, so I do agree with you, there, there is a corporate aspect, but you still, you've got to galvanize it, institutionalize it, and bring it down in so it becomes part of a norm. And so I, don't, I haven't seen a lot of norm going on. Education was talking about risk, one of the things you didn't talk about was risk tolerance. Correct. So I think one of the things is understanding the risk tolerance within your company, but then just having that policy isn't enough. You've got to have an assessment. Correct. So you've got to continuously assess where you're at, and I think that's where it comes in with the PMs, is as you're working through the projects, you're assessing where, where you're at. Have, have the threats changed? Has your risk posture changed? You, you now have this third party that may have added a risk or it may have reduced a risk, but it's just understanding those thresholds and ensuring that you're, uh, you're, you're monitoring and assessing and keeping up. Yeah, risk tolerance is a big thing. Um, let me just continue forward, um, but, and hopefully we'll, during the time we have, have some discussions here. So real quick, uh, what, what I was meaning by the terms is really looking at the process, information that you have, how do you safeguard that, how do you ensure that when you go through that process, um, your processes, your services have this mindset, cyber safety element to them. Obviously there's certain controls you need to meet, is things you got to validate, but again, what is the what is the uh, cyber risk regarding your project? A lot of projects don't do threat modeling. A lot of projects don't understand what their cyber risks are. They leave that more up to the corporate. No, we're covered because once we're once we're released, you know, it's there. But what I'm saying is, is you have a big impact to minimize that risk and also cost. There's a 70 to 1 cost, again, this is years ago when somebody said, I don't know what it is now, but if you don't catch something, and this is not just cyber, this is anything, but you know, if you're trying to address a cyber vulnerability or an issue later on in production, you're looking at a 71 cost. Um, so event, incident, breach, just want to quickly say they're different. I don't know if people heard these terms or not. But the biggest thing is an event could occur, you know, this, uh, you know, some firewall out there has an event. An incident means, hey, this is kind of an unauthorized event. We should look at this. A breach is when there's been an exposure. So that's, so if you hear that terminology when I talk about it. And resilience is, is even under an attack, and I think this is important for projects, when you deliver something on the cloud and you're running a, a business and say it's tied back to medical, People need certain information to, to make decisions on medical. You can't have that go down. So as you're building, you want resilience built into that. You know, the term resilience came in the military days, right? Certain, certain things that we used to do, you still have to be operational, you know, even under uh, certain attacks. So again, bringing some of that threat intelligence in, doing some of that threat modeling, understanding some of your project risk. I'm not telling you to dive deep. There's a lot of content here. There's a lot of stuff I left out because I could be very comprehensive. So I'm trying to minimize it, but, but again, these are some of the tidbits and tips that I think you're gonna have to bring in. I see it shifting too. 
Um, enough about me, you can go out and read it, but you know, I have a, a, a vast background from military, private sector, now doing some work for the, for the government through a, what they call an FFRDC. Um, I've also uh, done some teaching, uh, <coughs> stand up the program at Clark. So again, just all that says is it gives me different lenses to talk from this from, and that's pretty much what it is. So by industry, an audience poll, um, how many of you are aware of the threats and cyber breaches within your industry? Oh, very good. <coughs> Do you include threat intelligence in your overall project deployments? And, and what sector are you in or industry sector? Okay. Yep. And who remembers the first couple large data breaches? <laughs> Anybody name them? Yeah. Anybody here recently about orbits? Yeah. No. Uh, what's important about managing projects, project cyber risk through your lens? So sensitive data? Show of hands. How about metadata? Data about data. Actually, a lot of times, um, the metadata itself is very telling. So that's all I'll say about that. Sensitive systems and infrastructure. So even though it may not have sensitive data, but if it's a, a system that's providing access to sensitive data, right, we have to think about could there be lateral movement. Even though you may not have sensitive data there, but it's providing sensitive access, you know, sometimes I used to hear, and again, you all taught me stuff, is, well, there's no sensitive data on it. Yeah, but does it have, sensitive, does it have access to sensitive data through another system? Sure, well then, by definition, we need to look at those controls. Uh, privilege accounts. How many people know what a privilege account is? So essentially, you have some administrative level privilege to perform on a system. I can tell you right now, a, uh, a lot of the reasons why we have breaches is one, they get in, but two, people have more access than required, and three, that access is just replicated everywhere. So understand what privilege accounts are in the systems that you're deploying as part of your project, and make sure you have a way to minimize exposure to either the permissions they have, or the number of people they have. There are solutions out there now that make this a little bit easier. And even if you need to escalate privilege, so say you're a user and now you go into another part of an application that requires a break glass kind of scenario, that's an escalation. And nowadays, we're tracking that information because that's showing us behavior. It's alerting us. So we gotta get better visibility. We're still kind of in this visibility game. We don't have enough time here to talk about this, but um, I kind of have this evolution of security maturity. We're still really kind of in this visibility stage. <clears throat> Solution supply chain components and people. Do you guys worry about that in the projects? Some? Okay. And project sensitive data. So even though it might not be PII, EPHI, or some other corporate data, it could contain in your project data sensitivity, IP addresses. Now, granted, out on the public internet, you know, it's pretty easy to find those, but internally, maybe it's different, so. So real quick, uh, so here's the, this decade of cyber breaches. I have links in these, so you can go out and, and look at more stuff. Um, I'm not gonna go over it too much here, but I mean, this is just large. There, there are websites out there that can go through all different types of data breaches. So here's a threat map. We don't really have time to do this, but this is this is active. And again, I'm not promoting any company here. It's just I thought that this was a good way to show this. It's not, and going back to your point, um, it's not if or when. I mean, this is going on all the time, 24 by 7. Um, this little thing, advanced persistent threat. You know, there's different things going on from different countries. Um, this is an organization that kind of tracks that. So if you've got something that's released and available to the public, or even not available to the public, again, if we don't do multi-factor authentication, we just allow passwords, right? Um, 
So, but this is something if you want to go out and take a look at it and see what's going on, it'll show you some things. So this is where I like to get into. So how many know uh, the Verizon Breach Report? A few people, good. Again, I'm not recommending Verizon and anything other than I think they provide a good breach report. I've uh, seen this year over year, and why I think it's applicable here today is understanding one of the things I go back to that the project uh, risks or potential threats to your project. One good way to start understanding uh, what might be happening is looking at sourcing some information. So Verizon is one source, there are other sources. You can see here, Verizon covered a number of incidents. So this data that's here, remember incident, it's not necessarily breached. Breach means it was an exposure of some sort. And again, not every incident or breach is um, uh, reported. This here is just happened to be part of their caseload, so as you can see, it covers a lot. Um, let me just step back a little so you can see. Let the camera readjust. So as you can see, there's a lot of different industries represented here. And what I'd like you to do is, again, you don't have to uh, read through in any detail unless you love it. If you like it, it's a good reading. I like it. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but what I'd like you to do is, hey, look at your industry. And, and I actually I pulled healthcare out today because it is, it, I want to bring some of this information up so that you can you know, leverage this and take it away. So on, on the left here, you have totals, you have small, large, unknown, and then same thing with breach. You know, obviously, you know, there's different uh, incidents that are occurring here, but then you know, where are the actual breaches? When you start seeing kind of a high number of breaches associated with incidents, you know, that's something I think, I mean, this is still important, but this really starts to say, all right, okay, well, there's healthcare, um, let's see what else have we got here. Manufacturing, you know, there's a decent amount there. Obviously, public sector, uh, professional. Again, there's a lot of incidents, but still, I mean, there's, there's a number of breaches here. Retail, I mean, that's not surprising. And obviously this is some unknown. But again, every every industry has at some level of breach. That would be interesting. That report is based on uh, a number of systems and the practices used at the incident. And then of course you see there's a correlation between the incidents and breaches, and sometimes you have a lot of incidents but not very many associated breaches. Correct. But one breach could have three billion identities though. Yeah, so you go out here, there's a newer uh, report that just came out. This is, again, this is old data. Unfortunately, we need something that can catch, keep up with this, but usually these investigations, because they do a lot of number crunching and looking through it, it's usually a year behind. But there is something in Healthcare that was just released on PHI. So I definitely highly, highly recommend going out and look at that. I would have spun it up here, but you know, we're taking a little longer than I could talk a lot here. So executive summary level, I call them you know, cyber nuggets, but as you can see, um, let me just point out here real quick. 81% hacking related breaches leveraged either stolen and or weak passwords. So why not have a check in place as part of your project delivery to minimize that? Or is there an enterprise capability from a portfolio management standpoint that says, hey, we need a different way of managing passwords for our solutions, right? Wouldn't you rather invest that money up front than paying the breach cost after, as well as, you're probably in a breach response because we have some arrows in our back, right? Some battle scars from those. You end up implementing more than you probably need, but you have to satisfy that response. So, correspondence. Believe it or not, correspondence was one of the most costly things in a breach response that we had. We had to pay for the paper and mail it. So and when you have over 3 million members, right? So this is where that data manifest comes back. And we say, no, not 3 million, 100,000. What do you think the cost difference is on that? So, so these are the types of things back then we, we you know, try to bring it back to the business side of things. GDPR. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah. Something new. A lot, a lot of organizations. Raise the cost. Yes. Compliance raises cost. But one of the things, um, just real quick here, if I can digress. Um, so a lot of organizations back in the mid 2000s to, uh, yeah, I'd say about the mid 2000s, uh, they saw uh, security as a IT problem, not a business problem. So they pushed everything down to IT. And to be honest with you, at that time, probably not not a bad thing. But when you didn't continuously invest because hey, it's IT, so now your posture goes down. Now we come back to the compliance web. And so now we're spinning up, now don't get me wrong, I think compliance is important, um, very important for many different reasons. But compliance doesn't equal security because it doesn't keep pace. You still need compliance, but it created some unnecessary focus, dollars, and money when you forgot you had holes in the boat leaking water in. Right? So this, that's why we have, to, we have to look at it from both sides. And it's now becoming more of a board issue. And that's why we need PMs, we need other organizations to really work together in doing their part in minimizing this risk across the company. Uh, what else do I want to say here? Uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is known, but you know, 66% of malware was installed by a malicious email attachments. And we still click on it, right? Some of us do. There was, there, was, there was an email I got the other day through some trusted source, and I almost clicked on one. And I'm like, all right, that link, this here, something doesn't seem right. So whenever you think you need to immediately have an emotional click, <laughs> take a step back and think about it just for a second. Uh, yeah, question because I think this happens so much to us at work. If I'm at work, I get a suspicious email. Sh I shouldn't touch it. I shouldn't try to delete it. Should I call my, you know, security department? What's the best way to handle it? I'm sitting at my desk and I get one of those. So, if you haven't been informed already <coughs> on how to do that, well then that's that's a failure. <laughs> but uh, but then yeah, it should come out. There should be a communication on it uh, to tell you where to report it. Mm -hmm. um, when in doubt, you know, uh, and don't forward it to anybody. That's the biggest thing. People think, hey, look what I got. So don't forward it, just say, um, we have a situation here, uh, there's an email now. There's some newer technologies that allow that if they see some, if some of it opening up, it tries to contain it. And depending on how you have it implemented, but I can tell you right now, one big thing in the project management world that has a big impact on security is configuration management. You know, there's a lot of things that we overlook that during the project delivery on config management. I can tell you right now, that used to bite me in the, you know what, all the time, just in case if children end up watching this online. <laughs> um, so, to go to your question, if, if, you know, you, you should be informed. If you're not informed, I'd reach out to your, um, either your security officer also known as the Chief Information Security Officer. Some have ISOs, like Information Security Officers. Um, the other person to potentially talk to is your Compliance Officer. But I'd probably go to the Security Officer. Um, sometimes some organizations have a IT Risk Manager, which is separate from the business. Usually the Chief Information Security Officer is on the business side now, technically, should be. Uh, and then there's an IT Risk Manager performing the old CISO duties, but on the technical side. Um, so I would say you know one of those. All right, let's go to the next one. So here's another kind of tabulation, looking through different patterns. Um, so some of the patterns, obviously, are denial of service disruptions, privilege misuse. I think that's huge, privilege misuse. So um, either too much privilege, somebody else um, performing a function they shouldn't be functioning, and then not having safeguards. In some cases, it's the same level of admin access for the password across all of the devices or systems or environments. If one can get in one area, they're going to get across others. So there's different ways of segmenting this out. You work with your, you know, engineering group, either on IT or the security side, to do this. Um, but definitely, you need to really look at how you're managing the uh, the privileges and the web-based web-based attacks. 
Hacking, social, malware, ransomware. How many people have heard of ransomware? Uh, healthcare is a big target, right? Uh, how many people think if smart homes in the future <laughs> could be part of ransomware? That's actually a problem with a lot of the mobile software. They come out with the technology, but they don't work on the Yeah. So I mentioned state and current legislation about the COVID, the fact that any data at risk needs to be encrypted and decrypted, but the reality is that's really not going to protect it. Uh, heck, a lot of these morphins out of fishing than anything else. So. And then, you know, your comments about identity management, I mean, again, hopefully most companies have that stuff in place. So the role of identity management should be in place to get the same so, Yeah, there's this concept of zero trust. We won't get into it today, but um, and it's heavily focused on what they call dynamic identity. Sure. Um, centric approach to, to what you're talking about. But most people don't focus on the privilege account and privilege sessions that are being created. They don't, they don't look at that. Um, I should say there are some that are looking at it and it's increasing. Um, it's like when I go to stores a long time ago, I'd ask, uh, I'd, I'd check to see if they'd ask for my, on the back of your credit card, I always ask for ID. And uh, a long time ago, 20% of the stores would ask me for my ID. Nowadays, probably around 60, 70%. So, I don't know why I hold on to this data, but <laughs> um, Asset wise, going back to your point, you know, server is a big one, user device, obviously the person. Going back to your point, if I can impersonate your identity and there's no other way of saying, well, it's it's uh, his device has been attributed, so I know. Well, first of all, I know it's you through a multi-factor, but it's only from an op authorized device. You know, uh, you have to shrink what we call this attack surface. So, again, I don't want to go into depth on this, but what I'm trying to provide you is a source of information that you can begin looking at, and I, I'm going to summarize it so you have a little bit more context out of this now. Wouldn't this be a great opportunity to say, hey, I've got this project, and you're talking to, if it's not the CISO, maybe you know somebody that reports into the CISO, I've got this project, I want to know what threats my project may face, what, what cyber risks I have. You should see the smile on that other person's face when you say that, right? Um, but one of the things is, is understanding the information. So, you know, what, in, in the solution that I'm delivering, what could I, you know, be subject to in terms of some of the threats that are going on based on the industry you're in. Focus. Here we go. So bringing it all together, which uh, Verizon has this. All right, frequency. All right. So I mean, this is a number of, and again, this is only one vendor, one caseload of reported incidents. But pretty high fidelity that this, you know, a, a ton of breaches. Privilege misuse, miscellaneous errors, right? Physical theft and loss, representing 80% of the breaches in healthcare. So if you understand those risks going into your projects, what should you be doing? You should be understanding how these areas impact what you're delivering. And if you don't know, well then you partner, you collaborate, right? So the first time you go through, so the more times you go through this, there'll be more institutional knowledge that you get and go through. <coughs> But it should be no different than any other risk. You're identifying the risk. Threat modeling, uh, intelligence information is, in, in terms of this case, threat intelligence is helping you become more informed to make decisions around your project delivery. And again, uh, I used to love that when project managers would come and knock on my door and say, hey, can you help me understand my project risk? But that would never have happened if I didn't have Kathleen, if I didn't have other uh, PMs that I brought on my team, and then start cross-sharing this knowledge and information. You know, a lot of that is just about business relationship. Threat actors with 32% external, 68% internal, 6% partner. Again, external partner, I mean, this could, you know, a lot of people don't think of the supply chain, but a lot of times the supply chain is your weakest link. Uh, financial motivation, look at this, 23% fun. I mean, you have nothing better to do. 
Um, 7% of grudge. You know, so data compromise, 69% medical. And again, it's irreparable. Once your medical information is exposed, you can't repair that. Financially, there's stuff out there, but how do you repair your medical? Do you know how many people were walked to the door the last time George Clooney went to the hospital? 18. Yep. <laughs> the hospital put out and caught anybody who logged in, walked to the door. Yep. And that's great. There's some what we call deceptive technologies. Honeypot is some kind of older traditional type stuff, but yeah. So some of the deceptive technologies, um, like you said, you can quickly um, bring the bees to honey, I guess. Um, so again, what, I, what I'm trying to show you from this is, you know, source some information, um, partner with folks that may may answer some of these questions for you, right? How does it apply more so? But there's definitely information you can bring into your projects, be more aware, identify certain risks. And the little handout that I have uh, informs you of some hot topic areas in terms of risks, some questions there as well, and you'll be able to, to go through that. And really the purpose of that is, is just bringing your awareness. If there's, a, if there's an area that uh, comes back that you know has a gap for you, well then that's the area you should be following up on. So again, this is not a comprehensive list of things. It's not a comprehensive list of questions. Again, I didn't want to inundate you with a lot of stuff. I'm not selling anything. I'm, I'm just trying to give you knowledge. I was talking with somebody here earlier. The knowledge I'm trying to give you, it's, it's once you apply it, then it's going to have merit. And that's really what I'm trying to do today. So important risk factors, what we were just talking about, this is regardless of industry. So let's go over this. Um, So what cyber security info set risk do you currently have top of mind? You don't have to speak it out. If you want to share it with the group here, you can. Uh, we can briefly talk about it. There's a lot more material, so I don't want to take too long, but um, these are just some thought-provoking questions as well, but if somebody really wants to share with the group here, they can. Um, how do you seek or discover these risks? You know, do you have a project management uh, policy, guide, procedure? Is there something there that says, hey, are we checking on it? Are we asking all our PMs to check on it? What's the management discipline behind it? So again, I can tell you this, goes back to the configuration management. If, some, if the managers aren't checking on people doing the right config management, that config management's gonna uh, grow weak over time. So there's a management aspect of this report. Yeah. I know from a, you know different jobs I've had, you're doing these big projects and consultants are coming on board and you're working with different teams and they get access and no one's keeping a good pulse on are these guys still here um, and who's making sure they're rolling off the project when they roll up that their access is removed. And I've found that that is one of the biggest holes uh, in like from a project perspective or a program management. Everyone thinks someone else is taking care of it because they didn't know who brought the consultant or who was taking care of that. So I found that to be that was something that working with security, you know, you, you can have your software reviews, you know, if there's an upgrade in the middle and it's not what they initially assessed, that's a hole, but it was the vendor roll off that had elevated permissions because they needed that access to install the code or any of that, that was a huge hole. That, yep. that was one of the things working with the CISO saying, make sure this is on your project closure that you there you go to that list. Yeah. yeah, so, and again, I'm not asking you to put all this on your project closure list, but the perfect point what you just said. If there's a risk that we've identified, what, what is that practice? It's gonna be different for everybody. I mean, there are common things, but that's a great thing to have in terms of closure. Um, you know, what challenges do you encounter? I think we're going to move just for the sake of time here. I really want to. So I, I see, again, you all having greater visibility and opportunity of reducing business risk. You really do. And I tried to get that going uh, when Kathleen and I were working, and I think we did raise our cyber, cyber safety level um, and reduce some of our risk posture. Uh, but again, 
it really, it is a mindset. It's a norm. Some of these norms then have to have these project close out like we, we talked about. What are some of the questions up front? One of the things that we had when, when the uh, identity theft law came up, especially here in Massachusetts, social security number was a big one. And a lot of the data feeds don't need social security number. So we wanted to make sure all PMs, when they start a project, do you need social security number? Well, if you don't need it as part of your data feed, you've now just removed all that risk. Same thing with other elements. There's other data tagging techniques that are out there too today, so that if certain data is sen sensitive and should never go to the cloud, right? So what data should you be tagging so that you know when you're going through your cloud deployments that this data never ends up in there? Well, did you tag it in the first place? Do you have the data manifest? So again, how many people do a data manifest today? Only a few. So again, these, this is an awareness thing though. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. This is one of the reasons why I like to come out and talk to people. Because we, we, we gotta stop making um, better decisions, but we can't make better decisions without being informed. So one of the things I see here is, I actually see this happening. I know I did. Um, I'm seeing it a little bit more, but I think in the next not the 20, what was it 2030 is what you guys talked about last night? I think in the next two to five years, you're gonna see more of this right here. In the next two to five years. Oh, sorry, so program director project managers, part of the risk and incident response team. Especially if your project <laughs> caused the breach, right? <laughs> so, um, and for me, I uncover everything. You know, I, I go back, I need to know the source of where something started uh, in order to, to know that. And that's why the first question I would ask if you come to my meeting is, where's your data manifest? So now that you're all informed, work hard to get that. Sometimes you have to work with IT um, in order to do that. But, but again, this stuff needs to be driven. And certain CIOs need to know this and some do know it, that I've spoken to. Uh, because at the end of the day, there's multiple things that you need to address. A breach is chaos. I can tell you that right now. And so you, gotta, you, have, to, you have to be ready for it. You're gonna be able to supply certain information. And if you have your stuff together and say, we know exactly what data was sent, we know what people were impacted, and we know what systems it lives on. You can answer those questions quickly. That's going to help in terms of that incident response, breach response process. Oh, let's see, we talked about that. So, do anybody has anybody ever been called to an incident response? You yeah, have okay. A couple people. About? What is it, in service? No, no, incident response. Yeah, so if you have an incident, not, may, it's not considered a breach, it can only exposure. And so I used to make sure when we stated that, don't say breach. <laughs> Especially if anybody, you know, is uh, talking outside of the company, right? Don't say breach, we had an incident. Um, so a couple of things to think about. Hidden risk, unintended consequences. If you're now informed, you may think a little differently. Now that you have that Gmail account, two-step verification, you feel a little more secure having all your recovery passwords go into that account, right? A little better. But you also want to limit your device, not just your account. I just heard, and I don't know if this is true, so maybe you do, that Huawei devices are not being allowed by the federal government. You can't wear any of Huawei devices. Is that true? Uh, I can either confirm or deny, <laughs> but um, but there is, uh, and why I have this up here is you have to, yeah, so you, so you have to think about, you know, what information, how you're protecting that. It might be, and for intended purposes for health, yeah, it's great, but what else does it do? It tracks you. So, um, mobile phone applications, you have sensor private information. I don't know, how many of you actually have a mobile security software on your device? Required. How about personal phone? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, very good. So one area I'm hoping that they improve is containerization. 
So there's a way of compartmentalizing, compartmentalizing there we go, uh, certain actions. So if you're reading an email, visiting a website, it actually pulls it off into a container. And so everything, so it doesn't allow it to talk to anything else on your system and affect it. You're starting to see that across different systems, like servers and stuff like that, desktops, you know, virtualized type stuff. Phones, it's just starting to hit that way, but we really need to see that more. Yep. Yeah, so um, part of this uh, that's important is that certain services that provide, like you said, either that carries, whether it's mobile or broadband or anything else, so they have an opportunity to infuse cyber safety into their practices as well. Now, we're in a capitalistic world, so they may charge you for it, uh, but I think some of those. And so some of them are using it as a competitive advantage. <laughs> Which is good. Yep, it is. So again, but this is all raising the awareness of what we need to do. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention real quickly, how many people, it's probably on newer cars, but how many people have uh, GPS in, embedded in their vehicles? How many people delete the logs after? <laughs> so it also, it also provides um, visual link of where you went. So, but, but some of that information, do you want to keep it? I mean, it's up to you if, if you want to keep it. I'm just, bring, I'm just bringing your attention to it. No, no, there's, um, there's a way, we have to do it individually, I think. So, again, the reason why I bring it up is whoever delivered this as part of the project, they weren't thinking about some of these aspects. And so I'm just saying that, you know, we have to bring this mindset in to really think about. Again, there's a lot of pressure, time, money, everything else, I know, believe me. But you really just, if you're informed, you're going to make better decisions. And so, a very easy thing could be, you know, do I even want to capture this information? Let me decide that up front. So. Yep. Can I just ask, um, uh, am I being paranoid? Uh, yeah. I'm wondering if my laptop is listening to me. Because I talk to people and my laptop's open and then suddenly an ad appears that is related to what I was talking to the person about. Well, um, maybe we need to talk offline about that. But, um, but no, it, 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 anything that can be turned on programmatically, if the proper security isn't in place and it can be accessed over the network, you're, you're going to be able to. Turn that so off. I'm you don't have a lecture at home. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so speaking of this, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to, and that was a good segue. I don't know if you had the slides ahead of time or not, but I don't know if people remember Hartley Lee had to do with an SSL, open SSL, and, and we had that, right? So, how many people, you know, in terms of project data, right, when you, one of the biggest things that you want to understand is if something happened in one area, how is it exposing my business in another? So that project information I think is, is valuable information, rich information that you want to know quickly, not just for a CISO, but from a business, right? This is a chief risk officer looking at all business risk, right? Um, so this is the meltdown spectra. People are familiar with that, right? I'm not going to go into a lot of this stuff. I gave a, a little link, you can go and read all you want about this, but what I do want to point out, somebody just said over here, the bug confirmed fears about smart speakers. So nobody did that on purpose, or at least we don't think they did, right? But how could we have checked for that before the product got released, right? So these are things being informed that this stuff can happen. 
So I guess you know one of the things you should think about when you're implementing is yes, there's a benefit, but this is where the threat modeling comes in and understanding your threat intelligence. Well, how else could this be used against you? And I'm not saying that you have to become experts at that. I'm just saying, hey, identify some possible risks. And even if you're the top two or three that are addressing kind of those concerns I showed on the healthcare side to start with, you're minimizing that risk exposure significantly and you're raising the cyber safety level of your project delivery. And, and you know, having a high performing project management delivery that can also withstand cyber attacks is gonna be the true test going forward. Uh, one other one was uh, the bug that could snoop on your typing. Again, I don't like mentioning any names. You, if you want to go read the article, you can. My thing is just bringing attention. So it was capturing. Just looked like what a key logger would do. And it was only supposed to send log information but it sent everything you typed in, including passwords and clear text. <laughs> so again, not saying it's a project glitch, not saying it's a technology glitch, it's a glitch that nobody looked at. So how do we bring these two together to see that? So I have a question. It's, it's, um, Seven. Uh, if, I'm, <laughs> if, I'm not, if I'm on my network at home and I VPN in and it's secure, right, and you you get hacked through your own network, through the internet of things, because perhaps your network doesn't have all the security that your work network has. Yep. Is there a threat there? Do, you, do we need to think about that if you're working from home and you're using your network and it... Sure, you your, your network connects to a service provider, right? Yeah. Do you trust your service provider? <laughs> so, I really never thought about it until you that up there and I'm thinking, well, well very good. you get the smart speaker right, you're logged in on your home, yep. you, you know, and you're VPNing in and they make sure that secure tunnel, but what about that when they come in that way? Yeah, so I'll give a, a quick example. Again, I won't name products names, so, but there was a DVD player. Back then you had to buy a separate Wi-Fi connector to plug it in. And I said to myself, at that time, I'm like, wow. So I didn't segment that separately from everything else in my network. This was a long time ago. And um, so yes, I mean, does any device on your network, even printers, printers have hard drive, copiers have hard drive, they have network connectivity. Um, that could easily be turned into a surveillance device. Again, this is common knowledge. This is stuff I was talking about year, years ago. Um, so yes, anything that is cyber physical, doing some aspect in your home that connects to the network, if it's untrusted, it potentially, but there are some solutions out there that now will see certain devices classified and put it in a separate area automatically for you. So therefore you start grouping based on modalities and then you can adjust that as well. So now if something tries to talk to another device, it'll let you know, do you, do you allow this? And if you don't say anything, it's by default, it says no. That's kind of the, the zero trust aspect in that. It's explicitly permitted. You know, you, in terms of zero trust, you explicitly permit a resource to talk on. So this, uh, this does it automatically, and then it allows you to alert you. So the biggest thing that anybody can do, you, you can't prevent everything, but you gotta be alerted on it especially when it happens. And you want to put certain layers in place. You minimize what we call a footprint. So if somebody breaks into your home, you don't want them to get all the way to, you know, wherever you're hiding the good stuff. Um, so, you know, you want, to, you want to have different layers that minimizes their advancement. So maybe, so maybe, maybe you put something out on the counter that's fake jewelry you can buy for 10 bucks. Like, yes, we made a score, and then they're out the door. So. I've got to share this, this story. I'm sorry to take no, go ahead. two minutes. So I was talking to an Asian colleague about the fact that in the West it's rude to turn up to a business meeting, let's say, more than 10 minutes early. And he said to me, uh, oh, that's very interesting because the representatives of a certain equipment supplier that's been mentioned today, they turn up half an hour early and they sit in the, in the lobby. 
Uh, and if there's a photocopier in the lobby, they'll go and uh, check the memory. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's not a good thing. So one of the things that we had employed um, back in the day, so when you scan in the copiers, people can put in any email. So I immediately said, nope, only internal. And if you had to do something externally, you had to go through a different process. So, um, and in some cases, you can card swipe on certain printers too. I, that might be a little expensive, but again, there's ways ways to limit that. But some of those some of those configurations weren't there until what? There were incidents, customers asking for this kind of stuff. So until they're economically driven to do it, it's not happening. Regulatory can only go so far. Right, so it really comes down to the economic drivers. All right, so let's get into some of the uh, project uh, risk factor considerations. These are the ones that are listed on your page, the topic areas on the left. And this is this is a traditional kind of waterfall approach. I mean, if you want to go learn a little bit more about some of the security stuff that NIST does by incorporating, this is a nice little article to read. Again, everything you have to take and see how you tailor it and bring it into your own environment. As is, it may be too hefty. So there's other agile processes. How many people are dealing with DevOps? Right? So it's constant. Now there's people saying DevSecOps. Now security is more incorporated, right? So, so these risk factors can apply to any one of those models. Okay. So you have human factors, human error, social engineering, you know, we heard um, especially in healthcare, there's a lot of human errors that occur in terms of breaches. Um, so that's definitely one area to look at. Uh, whenever you have a manual aspect that you have to do, because a lot of times you, you're pressed for time to get a project in, and it's supposed to be automation, but it's like, no, we can't do automation, let's go around, we gotta do a manual process. You really should understand what, what is that manual process doing, especially if it's accessing sensitive data. Um, and you know, one simple thing might be is if somebody's importing something, what's the what's the check, right? How many people double check the doors when they go to sleep at night? That's more about toilet training. <laughs> <laughs> so, my wife Julie, uh, she does check, but she knows that I'm going to check anyways. <laughs> Uh, single factor authentication, right? If this single factor just meaning password, right? That should be an alarm, especially, you know, going to different systems. So, um, I don't think using a password, you know, people saying using a password is going to go away. Um, I think you need to have multi-factor. Um, but again, and this is something else I'll throw out that you can use both at work and at home. How many people randomize their usernames? Like their passwords, just show our hands. A couple. So instead of using your name as the login or your email address as the login, you actually create this crazy password kind of username. Yeah, no, I know. Change it up when you change your passwords because you can find patterns if you use the same. You can only change your password. You've got all these things to work Yep. So, 50% of the solution that a lot of adversaries and app guy actors out there have is they already know your login. So don't give it to them. So if, you're, if you can randomize both your username and your password, again, you're making that more challenging. You're, it's not that those still can't be compromised. You're making that a much greater investment. If somebody really wants that, it's gonna take a greater investment for them to get that information. And then by then, you're also monitoring stuff as well, so. so how, okay, so let's say you're doing that. How are you keeping track of all these? How are you keeping track of these random usernames and passwords? Yourself personally, or how do you record, how do you recommend that you do that? That's my question, too, because there, well, there's certain, some variety. Right, right, so you have hundreds of them. Certain, certain systems um, naturally have that, that can be pulled, like in an Active Directory or an LDAP. For your own personal, yeah. um, really there's no, great way uh, of doing that, but there are certain safeguards that you would do for any paper anyways, right? So in some cases, 
um, for you to remember. Now, if you don't remember, you go back to the two-step verification. As long as you've got a, a device that is authorized and you have a particular identity that you're doing any multi-factor authentication to, again, it's not zero risk, but you've minimized that attack surface. If you ever had to do a recovery, you feel a little more secure if you could get kind of all these crazy techniques. But uh, offline, I can talk to you about some other techniques. There's certain things that you should share, especially with this being public. And again, this is just some personal things that, that I do. <laughs> Unauthorized disclosure of sensitive data, privacy credentials, and project data. Um, I think this is a big one that I heard here today that people should just understand the sensitivity to the project data being collected. But there's also data around the projects themselves that's very useful to both IT, security, compliance, the business as well. Unauthorized change to non-sensitive data. So what I mean by this, healthcare people, clinical decision support, although there could be other decision support. Doctors are making decisions on public information that's provided to them. But if you don't, if somebody goes in and changes, hey, if they have this situation, we'll do this. Even, if, even though it's public information, if somebody goes in and changes that information, and somebody's reading it, hey, now granted, you're hoping that the, the doctor would take a step back and say that, that doesn't sound right. But a lot of times, don't we often read things and we trust it? So that's the other thing. How are you protecting non-sensitive data that's making critical decisions? A lot of people don't think about that. So if your you know, Twitter accounts are get uh, compromised, if you follow somebody on Twitter and say, all of a sudden I'm gonna do a stock change, and his or her account's been compromised and they put something on it, it forces you to go make a stock decision. So again, these are things you, know, you have to keep in mind around non-sensitive data. Misuse, abuse, and stolen privilege accounts. Can't harp on this enough. And I'll say this to a bunch of security folks. You have to manage your privilege accounts, especially with 81% of the breaches we saw here today related to stolen credentials. Misconfiguration or lack of configured technology assets, including cloud ILP and security infrastructure. Uh, and oh, by the way, another personal thing, but uh, just to share with you, how many have video cameras at home? Okay. Um, make sure you have something else to, to protect that as well. Because a lot of people don't realize if your provider set it up, more than likely they expose you through a service that goes out to a central site. And now people can look at your videos through that. So just make sure if you don't have it connected out, very good. But, um, but just make sure if you do have video surveillance at home that you set it up a certain way. If you want to talk to me, I'm kind of piloting. Um, some stuff right now to kind of help segment some of the IoT stuff. Um, untrusted and unsecured connections, infiltrated mal malco, malware, or bugs through the hardware software supply chain. We saw some of those. You can go read that article. They happen. They happen to us. Um, hardware embedded software in libraries. Um, I don't know. A lot of people don't realize, but when you buy a solution from a vendor, it's not all organic. Some of it is, but a lot of times they bring open source into their solution. So these are, again, project risks you should identify. Now, do you need to go find out exactly what that is? No, but you, you should identify, hey, this vendor also uses this open source software and library as part of the solution. Hey, security people, can you help me figure this out? Right? And just going back, you know, a lot of times, not having this out to folks, people would just go ahead and implement that solution, and now we have that risk. But now you're informed, you have it on that, that list up front, now it's, it's a mindset. Uh, cyber physical systems, we talked about embedded project and vendor staff. We've heard a few people talk about that today. So again, yeah, this is not comprehensive, but I think it's a good area, and this little uh, sheet here that you can bring home with you gives you a few questions. Um, at least in one area, just to think about, start having that dialogue. So how many of you engaged a privacy and security office early in the process? Okay, good. How many of you think you already have a cyber safe mindset? Well, you mean 
now or at the beginning? Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Uh, what systems and application delivery process do you follow? Uh, probably vary, but you, know, you probably you may have one. I don't know if you have a standard one in house. Uh, let's keep going. So here we go. This is this mindset shift. I do right. So these are the things that I do, and just like me, even if I don't, it's still a positive, right? Seek to understand my role in reducing business time. So again, these are some things as part of that mindset that everybody <coughs> should have. Now, in terms of what they need to do, well, you need to tailor that within your own process. But again, if you start having <coughs> this mindset, you can begin asking different questions, so things that we need to address. Yeah, I'm going to address that. They should be able to pin my map they cite in about a week. So real quick here, um, this is a little missed article here, uh, 800 Again, I, I think um, there's some really good things about NIST. You know, being on the private sector side um, for actually working, um, you know, in other areas. Uh, you know, there's certain aspects of NIST that are very helpful. It is a heavy lift on something, but it doesn't mean you have to implement everything. Just certain things. But one thing I like here is when you're defining your protection needs, right? So what's the input sources? From a stakeholder perspective, right? A system perspective, even a trades perspective. Trying to identify, now there's some outcomes here, that, you know, typical stuff that you were talking about in terms of requirements, uh, security policy, right? Now how many people here are required to write a system security plan as part of the delivery? Okay, not too many. The, the assessment that I spoke about is actually part of it, and then they're integrated into the website process. Okay. Yeah, and does that does that system security plan that you, you, you whatever you're calling it, does that live and breathe and gets updated and it's uh, tracked? Okay, yeah, good. Yes, I Perfect. And, and, and the third party thing, I mean, perfect example is Cisco, right? So Cisco outsources the multiple people to so others, the mental data and these other resellers. We also require to go through them and review this stock report before we get any type of business. So I don't, you, you would mention it as a recommendation, but I would say that it's mandatory. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would never say anything's mandatory here. I, I highly encourage a lot of this stuff, but, uh, but again, you have to look at uh, what your own industry, organization, and risk tolerance, as somebody mentioned earlier. Uh, that's very important. You know, certain leaders will say, they have a low or high, and that, and depending on how you gauge, you gauge those decisions. But hey, if, if there is something that you know could be a huge impact, you know, you should raise it. Because guess what? The, the company, either executives, the company itself, the lifestyle, anything could be impacted by that. Um, and it's the right thing to do for our customers and all of us. One thing that I don't see on here in terms of outcomes when you go through this from a project standpoint is you should have your project cyber risks listed here. So that's one important area, you know, have you addressed those? Uh, let's see. How many people do stage gates as part of defining these protection needs? So again, it doesn't have to be long and drawn out, but I think you should have some process as a stage gate. So hey, step one, what are our protection needs? Have we, have we captured those? Okay. Now granted, some things can run in serial. I mean, a par you know, parallel or, you know, I mean, they don't have to run step by step. So, but there are certain things that you have to work with your internal security staff and project staff to know, hey, this is something we really need to take, take a minute here and step back and talk about. But otherwise, you continue to move forward. But these protection needs are going to drive, you know, certain decisions on the project. So. I mean, a lot of people use quality management tools and test tools such as ALM and others, and that you develop those use cases in the stage case to satisfy security so that you're constantly reinforcing those through regression testing. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And do you guys also, part of that since you brought it up, do you also identify um, objective based pen testing? Yes. Because your threat model, right? You don't, you know, when you do a pen test, right? It's, I mean, 
in some cases you can't pen test everything. But if you know what your threats are, you can create certain uh, objective based pen testing. Maybe just tell the audience what pen testing is. So, so penetration test, so there's vulnerability testing. Vulnerability testing, does everybody understand vulnerability testing? That just tells you you have vulnerabilities. Pen testing takes it a step further and says, can we expose that vulnerability? Can we compromise the system? Can we actually compromise the system and get data? Can we compromise the system and impersonate somebody and you know, force a reaction? Now, this is all done very controlled. It um, has to be prior planned and any of the tools that go onto your network, again, you have to have a rigor, rigorous process to make sure you understand how you're doing it. Some, some cases, this is why the cloud is nice or virtual environments, because then you can hopefully, if you have replicated environments, you can test in that environment, not in fact production. So I talked about this before, budget. You know, there's a certain budget um, that you have, and a lot of times, if there's a, uh, and, and I don't know how many of you have spearheaded new capabilities and security and to pay for it, um, but Portfolio managers should be looking at you know what are the security needs across all of it, and then looking at that from a from a budgeting standpoint. Now, whether the projects each allocate into that versus one project happen you know happen to pay you know because they want that functionality implemented, they get to pay for the security control. To me, I I think a better way of approaching it business wise is you do that portfolio assessment and see is this going to be needed, and if so, um, what other projects can go across that. But I can tell you right now, if there is a variance, if you're um, if you're not being asked to budget for that, you really should, because in the end, you're still responsible for making sure that you address that variance. And then and then go easy on your go easy on your CISO. Uh, provide awareness training to all business owners, project managers, and project related staff. So this literacy I was talking about. So if there's some slight changes that you make, and again, introduce small changes. Couple of questions, a couple of key things, project closure, right? Do it over time. But focus it on your highest risk areas. If you don't know where your highest project risk area is, not just per project, your portfolio, right? It's an important step to work with your CISO to do. So now you're looking at it systemically, not just project by project. It'll be way cost effective, you'll have more friends, right? And then you can celebrate success together. Um, so looking from the other side, uh, so I'm a big football, I played football, coach football, like football, um, so I don't know how many people are football fans, but I'm just going to use the analogy here real quick that a quarterback on the offensive side, and I just recently heard a few years ago, a quarterback started doing this, um, they chose to pick a defensive position and to learn that to see what it's like to go against a quarterback or quarterback to go against. So again, getting in the mindset. So what does that do? Right? It's going to hopefully make you a better quarterback. Hopefully. Um, and, and believe me, it does, because now you start understanding the tendencies, the way they think, how they react. So the same kind of things ha happens here in cyber. So we got to start thinking, and that's part of this uh, prep model that you do too. You got to start thinking through that window. So the, the one thing that there's a lot of things that my company does very well. The one I work for today, and again, I'm representing myself. But the one thing I did get approval to put in here, which I think is important. I actually wish we had this, Kathleen. It wasn't available back then. Uh, we were trying to build something like this, but understanding the adversary tactics, techniques, and common knowledge. So you can't see this here, but you can go all to the website, but essentially um, this is what we call kind of a kill chain. And so it's really the steps that adversaries or bad actors take. And then there's certain things they can do within those areas. You know, say for instance, um, if they're doing a social engineering attack, you know, how would that compromise? What service is that going to compromise? What, what would that service allow me to then um, leverage a uh, local credential that's cached to be able to grab that credential, use it to then do some lateral movement. So again, one of the things to think about is your solution as you go through, you can highlight areas through that threat model here to kind of give you an understanding. Do you, 
do you have coverage today? Is the configuration, uh, is that covered, you know, to, to handle this? And what I highly recommend is you do this with, you know, your cybersecurity folks. And again, they would they would have smiles ear to ear if you go to them and say, hey, listen, I want to do a threat model for my project. So incorporate bad actor tactics and techniques as part of project control design and testing. So again, this feeds into that. Uh, collaborate with information uh, security office to create a project-specific <coughs> threat model. Again, project-specific. And you, you know, your security officer may not have this developed today, but wouldn't it be great if your PMO leader or director made that reach out to the system and say, hey, listen, we don't currently have you know, these project-specific threat models. So, so what would that take to do that? How, what kind of impact would it be? How could we slowly roll this out to begin understanding and reduce our cyber risk? And then going back to being very pinpointed, once you identify the threat model, hey, let's, in our test plan, let's be very specific about the current, how the current adversaries are going to attack our website, they're going to attack cloud when we deploy to the cloud. Um, if there's a solution today in terms of a SQL server, you know, what kind of database protection do we have in place? Again, tying it all back to your project risk that you've identified as part of these components. And when you're down to five minutes, you want to have a little Q&A time. Sure. So lastly, Uh, I don't know, I think this is the money slide, but, um, <laughs> and this is hopefully going to put money in your wallet. I truly believe that the more informed PMs we have and program directors, you know, you're going to be called upon to do other types of roles that have an impact on business risk. And so being informed and staying ahead, you know, you create your own competitive advantage. Um, but, you know, right away, establish cyber safe literacy through awareness, briefs, and training. So again, it doesn't have to be overly impressive. Just what are some of the key points you want to tease out to start getting people to think of different questions or raise different risks that you haven't had before. Understand the solution, attack surface, and threat model. So once you do that threat model, you'll know an attack surface, meaning that you know if I was going to get into this building here, what are the different ways I could potentially get in? So from a digital standpoint, that's what I mean by attack surface. Okay. And I don't have to physically be here on the internet, right? Uh, compartmentalizing risk and desensitizing assets. So, if you know you have certain assets um, that don't need access to something, then and compartmentalize them, don't have it. Desensitizing means reduce the information on it if it's not needed. Maybe it's data elements that aren't needed. Um, you also, again, going through this piece here, if there's um, certain systems that don't have to maintain the caching on this, we'll make sure you have a routine to delete that and then forensically wipe it. You know, so that, that's a different type of challenge. But implement multi-factor authentication. We talked about that. You can't hop on that enough. Limit and monitor administrative access and functions. That's a privilege account access type stuff. You can go through, there's some other things in here. You know, one of the things about managing sessions for privileged accounts, you can actually whitelist commands and you can record what's going on. So why even allow a bad actor or even somebody inside to access that account in the first place? I mean, it's good uh, to have some deceptive measures, but you also want to try to minimize that from even occurring that behavior from happening in the first place. And not asking questions leads to increased risk of a cyber safe project delivery. So I, I really appreciate you. I do. I am long-winded. A lot of people tell me that, but there's so much information that's out there. Hopefully, you're more informed. And uh, feel free to email me. Um, I'd rather have you email my personal email um, address, just because again, there's no affiliation with my current work uh, for this. And for me. And you'll probably get a quicker response because when I go home, I'm not connected to work uh, with my phone and stuff like that. So. Very good. Yes, thank, thank you. Good.